I was finishing, I think, the book of Exodus. And uh, this verse always jumps out at me and uh, causes me to think. In the various furnishings that God gave Moses instruction regarding the pieces that would be in the tabernacle itself. And in the, you know, the tabernacle, it had two parts to it, two rooms to it, right? Separated by a veil, a curtain. Uh, when you entered the first veil, you would be in the main room where the priest entered every day to minister, to serve the Lord in what was called the holy place, okay? But remember, there was another room separated by that veil, that curtain, uh, that was behind the, the first room. It was smaller, <clears throat> and it was only entered once a year uh, by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. That was called the most holy place. So the holy place, the most holy place. Well, in the holy place, there were various uh, pieces of furniture that God prescribed were to be put in there, uh, one of which was a seven-branch menorah, okay? This is a Hanukkah menorah. It's not seven, but it's nine uh, branches. Uh, the one out front, of course, is called the shamus or the servant candle that lights each one of these, uh, these candles to commemorate the eight days that the Jewish people celebrate the uh, Festival of Lights or Hanukkah. The reason it's called the Festival of Lights is because when the Maccabees defeated Antiochus, they cleansed the temple and they rededicated it. And they lit the menorah, the seven branch candlestick, they lit the menorah, uh, but they only had enough uncontaminated oil sufficient to burn one day. And it would take eight days for them to prepare ritually uh, permissible oil. However, as legend has it, miraculously, that one day's worth of oil continued to burn for all eight days till they were able to prepare the, the, the proper oil. I'm reminded of that when I read Exodus 27, verse 20, where it talks about the oil that was to be used in that menorah, in that lampstand. It says, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure olive oil, beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Now, what's significant in that uh, description is that it is called, it is a call not just for olive oil, not just for any olive oil, but for pure, what is called beaten olive oil, which is the superior quality olive oil. Before the unripe uh, olives are placed in a press, they are gently pounded uh, in a mortar, mortar uh, with pestle, and as a result, they bleed a clear, colorless, virgin olive oil that is then drained into a container beneath it. And uh, when that virgin olive oil is used as, um, as fuel for lighting a lamp, whether it be in an ancient home or here in this case, the menorah in the uh, tabernacle, the light would, uh, would be almost smokeless and it would produce a, a pure and a bright light which, as you know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by oil. So that pure beaten olive oil really is kind of a picture of the perfection of the Holy Spirit of God. But then also, think about that menorah that that oil was poured into, that that menorah, that seven-branched lampstand, was actually, um, it, it was the lamp that lit that holy place. 
And it was to be noticed in that 20th verse that I've just read of Exodus 27, the lamp was to burn always. It was to never go out. The seven branch menorah used to light the holy place in the tabernacle. It was the responsibility of Aaron and his sons to see that it always, that it continually burned and burned bright day and night. It, I think the menorah is really a symbol of Jesus, who is the light, right? He is called the light of the whole world. And when you put those two things together, the oil and the menorah, the oil and the light, I think uh, together they symbolize how the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus as the light to make the whole earth his holy place. Jesus is the menorah. He shines through the power of the Holy Spirit in his earthly life and ministry to bring this whole earth back to his original intended purpose to be God's holy place. Well, let's uh, let's uh, talk about another part in this, and that is how oil was not only used to light the menorah in the holy place, but how this oil was also used to be poured on people. In fact, kings and priests in ancient Israel were anointed with oil. Uh, they were anointed with oil, and it was a sign that God had chosen them for that specific role that they were being anointed with oil for. And when Saul and David, the first two kings of Israel, for example, were anointed with oil by the prophet Samuel, the Holy Spirit came upon them for that role, for them to fulfill that role as king. Did you know, and I think you do, that Messiah in the prophets was to be marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit upon him. For example, Isaiah 61.1, the Spirit of, uh, of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach. Jesus quoted that very prophetic utterance when he preached in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. He quoted that. In fact, the word Messiah, I'm sure you all know, is literally the anointed one, the Messiah, the anointed one. And one of the most significant aspects of Jesus's baptism is when he came up out of the water, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove the Holy Spirit descending upon the Messiah. It, it's, a, it, it's really symbolic of his anointing as he is assuming a new relationship uh, as the Son, the Holy Spirit, is assuming this new relationship with the Son of God as he is going to enter into his public ministry. He is Spirit-anointed, and it's notable, I think, that this anointing of the Spirit, symbolized by the dove landing on Jesus' head as he's beginning his public ministry, it's notable that that preceded him having public ministry. This anointing. The 12 disciples, or the disciples of Jesus, were told that he was going to go to his father, but when he went to his father, the promise was that he said, I, would, I will send upon you the promise of the Father, which was the gift of the Holy Spirit, that he, when he went to glory, he would send the Spirit upon them. So, as a result, the twelve were instructed to stay in Jerusalem until they would be endued with, until literally they would be clothed with power from on high, power being capital P, meaning the Spirit of God himself empowering them. And then you remember the early church itself was not released uh, for witness 
was not prepared to be his witnesses, to let their light shine, you might say, till the Holy Spirit came upon them. And uh, that's exactly what Jesus told them just before he ascended to heaven. He said to them, after this, the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. And that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2 on the, the fulfillment of the, of the Feast of, of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon them and they were all filled with the Spirit of God. Believers, you and I, who claim to be God's people, we can never accomplish effectively an enduring work for God till you and I as individuals are anointed with the Holy Spirit. Without his anointing, we are not fully equipped to minister to other people. For instance, listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, beginning in verse 3, he says to them, you are my epistle, my letter of Messiah, of the anointed one, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. In, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency of, is of God, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And then just the next chapter in chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7, here's what Paul says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Literally, our bodies are like clay jars, like, like clay lamps. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, this, this oil of the Spirit. We have this in these bodies, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So perhaps we should ask ourselves, how's your oil supply? How's your oil supply? You know, we heat our home with uh, diesel oil, right? With uh, number two diesel fuel, which is oil, oil heat. And uh, we're an automatic fill up. Uh, in other words, when it gets to a certain point, they automatically come. So we, we're not supposed to run. But, you know, believers can run out of oil <laughs> spiritually. Uh, that's not that they lose the Holy Spirit, but they don't have the Holy Spirit's anointing in their lives. And uh, so how's your oil supply? Is it, is it low? Um, is the light not burning as brightly, perhaps, as it, it ought to? How's your, your Hanukkah? You know, the word Hanukkah appears uh, in the, uh, the, the Gospel of John. You know what the word is? It, it derives from the verb to dedicate. And Hanukkah means dedication. So do you need to be Hanukkah, Hanukkahized today? Do you need to be dedicated or rededicated? How is your life and ministry as far as dedication is concerned, so you need to be lit up by the Lord for his glory. Well, how can that happen? How can you be lit up like a Hanukkah menorah? How can you be lit up with the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit in your life for serving the Lord? How can you be lit up? Well, I want to close with just uh, four thoughts. The first one is, it'll never happen until, first of all, you believe it. What I mean by that is, you believe God's promises, that he will give you the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit in your life and your experience. Did you know <clears throat> that there is a Greek translation of the Old Testament? It's called the Septuagint. It was done by 70 uh, Jewish scholars uh, that lived in Alexander, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, way back. Uh, but anyway, 
Jesus quoted more really from the Septuagint than he did from the Hebrew Masoretic text, which I think is interesting. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I bring the, the Septuagint up, this Greek translation, because in that Old Testament translation into Greek, the same word for the anointing of the priest, for the anointing of the Messiah, and the anointing of, uh, of you and I in the New Testament, same, same word is used. We are promised that God will anoint us with the Spirit of God. And when he does, there are three results. And I, and I want to share these with you as quickly as I can. Number one, if you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, you know what it will do? It will enlighten you. It will illuminate you. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, we have an unction from the Holy One, the Holy One being the Lord. In the 27th verse, he tells us what that unction is. In fact, the word unction and the word anointing in verse 27 are the same word. He said, and we have an anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we need not uh, that any teach us. We have the teacher who anoints us in us. That anointing, that understanding, that illuminating is really that the Holy Spirit of God, when he anoints us in this way, he invigorates our mental faculties so that we are able to see great truth in the scriptures. And, and that truth jumps out at us. That truth get, grabs us. We get insight and understanding into that truth. That is the Holy Spirit's work of anointing. It's an anointing that enlightens. But there's another aspect in which the Holy Spirit uh, promises to anoint us, and that is in the area of holiness. If you struggle living a holy life, you need the anointing for that. It doesn't uh, happen by human effort. The, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is so that we can live a holy life. In, he, in uh, Ephesians 5.18, that's what he's talking about when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Literally, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about an anointing to live a holy life, and he tells us how that looks and how that works out in, uh, in our home and uh, in our work and in every area of our life in the, in the uh, verses that follow. The anointing to live a holy life is a life that is infused with uh, Jesus's holy life, which is a loving life as well. There's another promise regarding God's anointing that you need to believe. Not only with the Holy Spirit anointing you, will you have enlightenment, not only will you have uh, holy living, but you'll be able to minister to people, lost and saved alike, because Jesus said that if you believe me, if you, if you thirst and you come unto me and drink, he that believeth on me out of his belly, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And that's talking about having just a liberating ability to speak boldly of Christ and for Christ. And that is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So you have to believe it. These promises of enlightenment, of holiness, of ministry that the anointing spirit can give to you. And then once you believe it, it doesn't happen automatically. You got to ask for it. You got to ask for it. In Luke chapter 11 and in the 13th verse, just previous to that, Jesus says this. He, he, he says, ask and you shall receive. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it'll be opened unto you. He said, what father, if his son asks for bread, is going to give him a stone? If, if his son asks for fish, is going to give him a serpent, <laughs> you know? Uh, and he, he says, and how much more if you 
fallen fathers will do this for your earthly son. How much more will your father in heaven, listen to this, give Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And the, and the key here is that uh, there is no definite article in our English translation. It's inserted but there is no definite article uh, before the word Holy Spirit in Luke 11, 13. And so it's not talking about getting the person of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's talking about getting the provision of the Holy Spirit, uh, his, his quality, his function, his power. So he's saying the, God will give if you ask him, he will, if you simply ask in faith for the Holy Spirit's power at the moment that you need it, for whatever you need it for, he'll give it to you. But you got to believe it, and then you got to ask for it. And then thirdly, what good is asking for something if you don't take it, if you don't reach out and receive it? That's where the faith comes in. Remember Acts 1.8, I quoted a moment ago where Jesus said, after this, the Holy Ghost shall, shall come upon you. Uh, you shall re receive the, the gift of the Holy Ghost, which will come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me. He says, you have to receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And that word receive in Acts 1.8 is the same word that is often uh, translated take in our New Testament. In other words, you ask, but you also, with that asking, you have the responsibility to, by faith, take the Holy Spirit's power. And, you know, when someone gives you something, when you ask for something and someone gives it to you, it's only courteous to say thank you for it. And, you know, when you ask the, when you ask the Father for the power of the Holy Spirit, and then by faith you take it, you can seal that and confirm that action in your mind by thanking him for it, even though you don't feel anything. But you thank him because you take it by faith. And then there's a fourth and final aspect that I, I think uh, is how you get it. Not only believe it, not only ask for it and take it, but finally, then act upon it. <laughs> act upon it. Act as if it is a reality, whether you feel it or not. Act upon it. Acts 5.32 tells us that God gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey him. And to obey him is simply to act upon what he's asked you to do while you are depending upon him to enable you to do it. You act on the reality that the Holy Spirit is enabling you at that moment. You step out in obedience to the command of God or to the will of God, and you simply trust him to enable you to obey, to carry it out. So that is how you can be lit up, anointed for God's glory. You have to believe it. He promises it in those different areas I've mentioned. You got to ask for it. doesn't happen automatic. And then once you ask for it, it doesn't make sense unless you take it too. And then when you take it, then act on it, utilize it, and see God work. And you will see God work. There, I heard a story of a little girl. They were singing a song in church, and the, and the line of the song said, Send the fire, Lord, send the fire. Send it if we, uh, send it, we implore thee. Fill us with the Holy Ghost as we bow before thee. And those words, send the fire, uh, startled the little girl. And she, of course, thinking literally, thought the worst case scenario. And she tugged on her mom's dress. And she said, Mom, do they really mean it? Send the fire? Do they really mean it? Do you really believe that God will anoint you and that he will send the fire, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit? in your life, at the moment that you need it, if you will believe him, if you will ask him for it, if you will take it, 
and then act upon it. Some of you have experienced that. Others have not yet. And it's about time you experience that anointing oil of the Holy Spirit empowering you to do what otherwise you couldn't do. There are people that don't serve the Lord in certain areas because they don't think they can. Well, that's really the first step to being able to serve the Lord is just recognizing I can't, but as I depend upon you, if this is your will for me, you can make it happen. You can do it through me. And that's an area, that's that's a place that we need to get in our life with the Lord. 